told each other that morning how conservative we are. We said we believe in rules, even though nobody thinks we do. Life, she's a strange old train, running usually like a runaway while nobody knows the rules. That just talk. Better watch you run your horse in smaller circles. Watch you run your horse in smaller circles. I saw you run your horse in smaller circles. You ran your horse in smaller circles. The feather in your hair is flying in the wind. I stood and I watched you. Watched you ride like I could never do. And I never saw much a prettier thing I thought than you. Running your horse in smaller circles. Running your horse in smaller circles. You said you go through a lot of guys. I can't say I was too surprised, babe. I got eyes. You said it's hard to find a guy to want you for who you are rather than for what you do. I don't know. I see much difference in the two. I saw you run your horse in smaller circles. I saw you run your horse in smaller circles. I knew when I first saw you all those years ago that I expected then I'd get to know you a whole lot better. We run the same circles. We run the same circles. I used to ride more wide, but we love most the people we resemble most. And I look at you almost like I'm looking in a mirror. So now you're gone to Mexico. God knows where you'll go in all the years to come. I don't know if you'll remember me, but I don't see how you can help but see when you look into your mirror, me, running forever, my dream horse in smaller circles. Grandson of Chief Nosey, the Cinnaboyne chief who settled first, Lodge Pole, Montana, up on the Fort Belknap Reservation up close to the Canadian border. Andrew Gray died in July 1969. He collapsed, mortally stricken. His heart burst while he was singing at a Sundance at Rocky Boys Reservation out south of Haver. Andrew Gray was buried in infant dress, buried on a hill high above his house in Lodgeville, 
at his burying, the American Legion in uniform fired off rifles and eagles circled above. Only a month before, on Memorial Day, Andrew Gray prayed at his family cemetery on another hill out toward Big Warm. He prayed in Indian and he prayed in English and his family put plates of food on his relatives' graves and eagles circled up above. And then we drove to another place, circled the pickups and the cars and ceremonially and in fact we ate pub. Still gray flat top. I don't think I spoke over 20 words to him, but something happened. His family became my family, still is up in Lodgepole, Montana, where, right now, the wind is blowing hard from the west, where sweet grass is waving in the wind. Andrew Gray ran out of gas in Ghost Cooley late one dark night a long time ago. Andrew Gray had a friend in the car that night, a friend who wasn't sure he wanted to be out at night in Ghost Cooley. Ghosts follow people. And if you hear a ghost following you at night, then don't look back. If you do, your face will turn. Andrew Gray knew he had to walk for gas and go coolly that dark night long ago and his friend wasn't about to go so Andrew Gray took off walking and his friend waited waited slumped down in the car seat so he couldn't see outside couldn't see what might roam the dark night outside in ghost coolie and something came some person came walking soon and Andrew Gray's friend thought Andrew Gray was back already, so he sat up and looked, and there was no human thing there. There was no human thing there. And Andrew Gray's friend sank back in panic, sank back in the car seat below the windows. The footsteps came closer, came directly to the car, and Andrew Gray's friend could not breathe in his fear. The car began to rock back and forth. Andrew Gray's friend cried out silently. Then the thing went away. Andrew Gray's friend felt the car quit shaking. He heard the unhuman steps walk away. Andrew Gray's friend lay in the car seat, shivering for a long time, afraid the thing might come back, come walking ghost steps back, and ghost coolly he lay and shivered and yet. After a long time, he did indeed hear footsteps again. Again, footsteps came to the car. Andrew Gray's friend could not move. Footsteps came to the car. Andrew Gray's friend could not breathe. And then, the car door opened. So are you asleep, Andrew Gray? Asked his friend. It was Andrew Gray with a can of gas. Did you see it? Andrew Gray's friend asked Andrew Gray. Did you hear it? Did that ghost come after you? Andrew Gray poured gas in his gas tank on a long ago dark night at Ghost Cooley. Andrew Gray said, yeah, I heard it. Andrew Gray said, it come after me. Andrew Gray said, I said, if you're a ghost here, then you must be a relative of mine, Andrew Gray said. I said, why would my relative want to hurt me? Andrew Gray said, I said, why don't you help me? Andrew Gray said, I gave him a cigarette. Andrew Gray said, it helped me get this can of gas.
Seth Levick went out all the way to post. She took the wheel one night so I could sleep. It was the fall of the year. The cotton was all in. The highway man, it was smoky from the smell of the gin. Night driving down them plains. She could smell them burning birds. And it took 20 years. Off her life. six years old pulling cotton with her mama man she was running down that road first she pulled in a bucket to help fill her mama's sack Then she was old enough for a toe sack of her own. In the fall of 56, she was in the third grade. She pulled a lot of cotton and with the money that she made. That fall, she bought her first new coat, the first one from a store. She missed a lot of school that fall, man. And man, she pulled a whole lot of cotton. the bay I've been writing West Coast songs thinking we'd found the way that we ought to be a living for the rest of our lives long gone Texas singer man is long gone Texas wife and we've been living in Montana Living with the sea. Living life. Close to life. The way those people do.
And she told me that she thought it was time to go on home. My long gone Texas woman with her long gone Texas song. She's driving home. She remembers cold nights with her mama and the kids huddled close together, waiting in the pasture, down hit out by the creek, waiting shivering cold till her daddy go to sleep. And they'd find him back there. In that tin roof little house with the windows broken out by his whiskey bottles. So I guess you'd wonder why I might take her home. Why she's driving straight for home while I'm sleeping. Cause man, it don't matter where we stay for the rest of our life. I'll be a Texas singer, man, she's gonna be my Texas wife. Cause man, it don't matter where we stay for the rest of our life. I believe I will be a Texas singer, man, and she will be my Texas wife. This was in the colony of Virginia in the year 1752. I said to him, I said, I am your descendant from two centuries into the future. And the Scotsman looked at me, uncomprehending, and I said, Man, I've come to kill you. And then the Scotsman knew me. Saw his blood after all in my veins. My God, he said, you cannot kill me, he said. I am your ancestor, he said. Without me, you cannot be. I said I must. I said I must stop the thing that you will become. I said I must stop the thing that I myself might become. The Scotsman said, my God, he said, I'm a good man, he said. He said I'll marry a good woman, he said. We will found a dynasty of good Presbyterian Scots-Americans, he said. He said we will love and help our brothers, he said. We will bring God to this dark and godless place, the Scotsman said. We'll bring good Scots sense to build a rich and bountiful place in this wilderness. But then the 
Scotsman saw the bow, the wood and horn bound bow. He saw the stone tipped arrow, the black obsidian tipped arrow. And I said to the Scotsman, I said, I will kill you now. My God, the Scotsman said, knowing his death is near. My God, the Scotsman said, my God, you cannot be that cruel. I am your past, the Scotsman said. How can you kill the part of you that I might sift again? So then I shot him. The arrow penetrated the upper half of the Scotsman's heart. The black obsidian point driven by wood and harm went all the way to the Scotsman's body and he looked at me in pain and in confusion and blood slowly started dripping from the corners of his mouth and then dripping from his nose and then the Scotsman let go and the Scotsman died. I had his long, deep, dark red hair in one hand and I had my knife in my other hand.
stories try hard to be in them. And living is in them. But expecting to live forever. Which way things might go If its stuff has never been the problem The living earth was always watered with living blood The Christians had to have their Jesus murdered And the Aztecs kill their children So that ever spring would come Neither the earth nor all this universe ever offered free rides. We pay for what we are given. And what we take, we pay. We pay for what we are given anyway. And man, then the payment's always higher. That's why our lives are filled with empty And our deaths make no sense That's why so many died When we fought on the wrong side That war over there in Southeast Asia That's why acid falls as rain And water turns to poison That's why cancer eats our bodies that's why we shoot each other for no reason. We have stomped across this earth, and now we are turned to stomp the stars, caring for nothing but to conquer, to turn everything to ours, to turn it to our use and to our image, to kill it if we can use it to kill it if we don't need it. It didn't have to be this way. There was a time I know, not really that long ago, when no one yet could know which way things was gonna go. told him to rule and that they got dominion from him their God and ours no man they sure have tried they had a second chance when they went to spread their rule, there were continents of peoples whose gods never said such a foolish thing. They say, it has to be this way. They say the time has shown which gods have won. I 
I suspect Joe Hill really did kill. I suspect Joe Hill really did finally kill. But not for personal gain, nor political, nor for glory, but simply to destroy, crush, bloody one human being. Joe Hill killed no symbol. Joe Hill killed a singular human being who for that moment had ceased any singular humanity. Joe Hill projected all his hate for the labor bosses, the landlords, money men, bankers, industrialists. Joe Hill projected his hate into a pistol bullet that slammed, crashed into the head of a surprised, retired cop, grocery store owner in Salt Lake City, Utah, 1914. I was at the State Fair of Texas. One time on a warm afternoon and I was sitting drinking vodka in the sunlight when the Marines come marching, band playing. Old glory World War II patriotism, the Marines come marching. Their spit shine shoes was clicking on the pavement. So I got up and I walked with them in front of them, out of step, too close and I think they noticed I was not holding my hand over my heart when old glory passed. So, the Marine closest to me, the Marine I was laughing at, he took charge of the situation and without moving his fine, young, American face, he said to me, from between clenched teeth, he said, freeze, said it just like that just like a television cop or a real cop. And man, I remembered such fine, young American servicemen from 15 years before, from my own college ROTC marching when I myself was going to be an officer in the service of my country. I remembered, and I knew well enough, Though soldiers' major crime is always ignorance, soldiers are not evil. Almost always, they are ignorant. But yeah, then, then, nevertheless, right then, oh yeah, I could gladly have seen my own pistol shot crash into that fine young American face and carry my own hatred for the landlords and bankers the political enslavers and the economic imperialists. With all my feelings for the Spanish Christians and what they did to the copper mine Apaches, with all my feelings for the European sufferings of these two American continents, with all my feelings for the things done to this whole living earth, with all my feelings for the bankers, landlords, industrialists, Christians, communists, and every wearer of any uniform on this whole living earth, then, man, I could gladly have shot that kid full in the face and watched with glee the bashed bone, the splattered brain, the snot, the cartilage, the pulped flesh, Soil, the front of his ugly United States Marine uniform. But I don't carry a pistol like Joe Hill did, always in his shoulder holster. And if I had killed that kid then, after the adrenaline hate had blown apart, his flesh neat head, then there would only have been one more poor dead kid lying on the concrete, the State Fair of Texas, and I would have been left like Joe Hill was left in the silence of his Mormon jail cell. I would have been left 
to judge whether or not my act had broken any of my chains. And man, I can't answer for Joe Hill's chains or my own chains because I didn't kill the poor kid and I don't expect I ever will kill. But still, sometimes, man, when I pull up at a stoplight and look over into the next car to some business be suited mover of the product and I see a righteous lust for the product or a righteous lust for Jesus or God knows even a righteous lust for cocaine in his steady, cool, chrome eye then, man. Man, I can almost feel that 357 Magnum pistol recoil. And I know I'd only have one more ignorant pawn of a corpse on my hands, but man, sometimes I do dream about Joe Hill. When I dream, I dream that he is me. Sometimes it seems like his old town is dying from trying too hard to hold on. The fences and the stockyards, the cowboys and the cattle guards can't hold on to something that's gone. years in this Texas corner cafes. One time she went up to Abilene and she worked for 18 months and she spent six years in Snyder but all the rest of all that time she worked and she lived in Ballinger. Willie never was worth much as a cook. Her mama never taught her how to cook so Willie waited tables and sometimes she took the money I can still see her, leaned up by the register on the counter, digging in her ear with a stiff black bobby pin. She wore way too much makeup. Her cheeks were nearly flaming. She dyed her hair jet black. Willie must have been all of five feet tall and I doubt she could have weighed more than 80 pounds. 
She must have been near 70 years old the first time I remember her. Willie was almost my kinfolks. Her sister, Sandra, married my great uncle Clay and they lived out in the oil fields out at Forsan where the sulfur from the wells makes the air smell like rotten eggs. Clay was a horsebreaker, and they say a good one. He and Billy Tabor broke in one summer more green horses than anybody else still has out in Glasscock County. But Willie, Willie she never married. She spent her life in corner cafes serving coffee to cowboys and leaning up on her elbow on the counter. when he come to the cafe. I used to see him there. I watched him drink his coffee. He always wore a big felt cowboy hat, even in the summertime, and he wore those laced up shoes that were built like cowboy boots without a top. And he always wore a tie. His face was a texture of wrinkles, and I made jokes to Judy. While we sat in a booth at the back, eating chicken fried steaks, I'd say, there's that old boy again who punched all them cows up on the Powder River in 1912. And you know, what man, he just might have done that. They said he had been her boyfriend since they were both teenagers. They said the two of them were set to marry when he left the state of Texas, went to Cowboy up in Wyoming, and he stayed there for 30 years. They said he married up there, and he ranched outside of Douglas. And Willie, Willie, she went to cafes. And he had sold out and come home before I can remember. I don't know if his wife died or the winters just got too hard. They got some damn hard winters up there in Wyoming and Willie. Willie turned from a teenager into that old fool with painted face and jet black hair digging wax out of her ear with a hairpin. And nobody blamed her boyfriend. In fact, they kind of thought he was some kind of hero to come home and try again after 30 years up in Wildman.
and Willie. Willie, she took tuberculosis, and that ended her cafe days. I was gone from home to college when my mama called and told me Willie had died. Died in her room in that old rock hotel by the railroad in Ballinger. It was the coldest of January. There was snow on the ground, and they said they found Willie on the floor by the stove, one of those old black heaters with an asbestos back. And they said Willie was naked. And I was struck near hysterical. I couldn't sleep at night. Time came falling down on me. I had been in that room then. I went there one time with my mama on some kind of business. It was a room not 15 feet across and they said that old woman had lived there for more than a generation and I had been disgusted that that old clown of a woman could have lived that way forever. At least, man, her boyfriend had the sense to pull out for Wyoming. But now, I had myself a vision. I saw Willie dying. I saw Willie in her bed in dark winter morning, long before sunrise. I saw Willie dressed in heavy nightgown covered up with many blankets. And I heard her start the coughing, trying to find her breath again. And I saw her shiver from the cold that came now from deep inside her. I saw her get up from the bed to go and light that old heater. I saw her squat before it. The flame not a foot away. I saw her squat by the stove, her arms around her knees. I saw her body start to die from the coughing and now from the time. And I saw her stand up and pull the nightgown off her shoulders let it drop to the floor while she tried one last time to find her body. And I saw her rub the palms of her hands across her flesh, what there was left of it, stretched and sagged across her bones. And man, I tried to imagine what she was thinking. I tried to put my words into her mind. I tried to write about it. And I don't know why I even cared. I mean, man, she was just an old painted woman who lived and died in West Texas, serving coffee to cowboys and picking wax out of her ear with a stiff, black bobby pin while she leaned on her elbow on the counter. This old town is like a woman that's weathered and widowed and wishing for something to hold. There's a light in her mind that she's been looking Shine.